Hello and welcome to Praxis, the monthly series of debates and discussions relating to international development issues hosted by the World Bank in Sydney. My name's Ian Gerrard and as ever, I'd like to extend a special welcome to everyone watching at home on APAC or over the internet or listening on radio across the Asia Pacific. Today, in addition to our audience here in Sydney, we are joined live by our audience members in Dili and in Port Moresby and they will have their chance to put their questions to our panellists a little later on. This month's topic is health, and with me to share their thoughts on this vital issue are the Honourable Bob McMullen, Parliamentary Secretary for International Development Assistance, Tim Costello, Chief Executive of World Vision Australia, and Stephen Close, Human Development Specialist for the World Bank's Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islands Country Office in Sydney. Unfortunately, our fourth sh scheduled speaker, Save the Children Chief Executive Susan Dvorak, has had to withdraw due to illness, and she sends her apologies to all concerned. In a speech she made in Geneva earlier this month, Dr Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization, argued that the global focus on health is the key to the welfare of humanity. Already, around one billion people are living on the margins of survival. It does not take much to push them over the brink, Dr Chan said. That situation has been vastly compounded, of course, by the global financial crisis. Ban Ki-moon, United Nations Secretary General, has said that when it comes to achieving the eight Millennium Development Goals, at the very least, the GFC will throw us off course in a number of areas, particularly in developing countries. So what does that mean exactly? Well, according to Professor Graham Brown, Director of the Nossel Institute for Global Health in Melbourne, it means an increase in poverty and undernourishment, with rising food prices leading directly to ill health. All of the Millennium Development Goals are relatable back to health to some degree, but three are health-specific. MDG 4, to reduce child poverty, MDG 5 to improve maternal health and MDG 6 to combat HIV AIDS, malaria and other diseases. The pre-GFC figures for those goals are encouraging, both regionally and across developing nations as a whole, but improvements are still needed to make all the 2015 targets achievable. In her recent speech, the WHO's Dr Chan talked about climate change's increasingly adverse impact on health worldwide. Her organisation estimates that about 150,000 people die each year in developing countries as a result of climate change because of crop failures and subsequent malnutrition, gastrointestinal diseases, malaria and flooding. Our own region is of course particularly prone to the effects of climate change. Dr Leslie Russell of the Menzies Centre for Health Policy has spoken of the considerable health, social and economic consequences of climate change in the developing countries of the Pacific Ocean where fragile environments, failing economies Poor population health and a shortage of needed workforce skills mean there are fewer resources to prevent and manage them. Nor should it be forgotten that avoidable health crises are particularly preva prevalent in de developing nations. One billion people are expected to die as a result of smoking this century, 80% of them in developing countries, where 70% of all cigarette production and consumption now takes place. It's time now to hear from our panellists. And once they have had their say, I'll be inviting questions from the audience in Sydney and in Dilly and Port Moresby. Our first panellist is the Honourable Bob McMullen, MP. Having previously served as a senator, Bob has been a federal member for Fraser since 1998, having first been elected for the seat of Canberra in 1996. He has been Parliamentary Secretary for International Development Assistance since the Rudd government took office in November 1997. Between 1996 and 2007, Bob held a number of shadow ministerial positions, including shadow treasurer, shadow minister for finance and small business, and shadow minister for federal state relations. He joined the cabinet as minister for arts and administrative services in 1993 and became minister for trade the following January. Bob. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to talk today about this very fundamental question of health and international development, particularly here in our Asia-Pacific region. In the limited time available, I want to talk specifically about the investment case for maternal, newborn and child health. It's based on this document, which is uh, called Investing in Maternal, Newborn and Child Health, which the Australian Government published with the World Bank, the WHO and a number of other partners. And we launched it recently at the annual general meeting of the Asian Development Bank. And it sets out 
not just the moral case for investing in health, but the economic case. Why it makes sense economically to invest in maternal, newborn and child health? We're currently in the grip of a recession and the world has mobilised massive resources to respond urgently to that high priority challenge. What I want to argue today is that we need a similar sense of urgency on mobilising response to poor child and maternal health in the developing world. This document, the investment document that we published, publishes a list of what we call possible best buys that people might purchase, that governments might purchase to improve maternal and child health. As an analogy, we see every week in the newspaper best buys from the local supermarket where we go down and fill up our trolley with the best buys from uh, those advertised by the, almost, the slightly competing supermarkets we go to around the region. What we want to say is let's respond to the best buy options about maternal and child health. What the report says is it might be that we'd be filling our trolley with vitamin A supplements or insecticide treated best, uh, bed nets or education on breastfeeding or birth spacing or something as simple as hand washing and uh, sanitation. We'd be buying the services of skilled birth attendants and antenatal care. And if we bought these best buys, something quite dramatic could happen. Millions more children would live beyond infancy, mothers would have safer pregnancies, and their newborns would survive. Over time, these mothers and their children would go on to live healthier and more productive lives the benefits would not only be to those individuals and their families, but to the community and the nation on an enduring basis. It's estimated around 9 million children in the world die before they turn 5 every year, and 40% of them in Asia Pacific, and more than half a million pregnant women die every year, half of them in our region. So the case for action is compelling. There's an obvious moral imperative. But beyond that, there's also a clear economic and political gains to be made through redu reducing child and maternal mortality rates. And we know that there are tried, testable and affordable ways to improve child and maternal health. And what the research makes clear is that if we invest in those ways to improve child and maternal health, we will get a massive return on that investment in terms of improved productivity, reduced expenditure on disease subsequently, children who are better nourished in their early years live much healthier lives for the rest of their life. It is, we know in Australia, we know in the developed world that this is the best form of health investment. We need to apply that same principle in the developing world. So this is a big challenge for policy makers, for all of us in the developed world who are seeking to contribute for the international organisations like the World Bank and the WHO and the Asian Development Bank and others for the Australian Government. All of us need to focus on how we lift our, the effectiveness of our, our investment on maternal and child health. It is of course fundamental to the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals that Ian just referred to. Four and five we can't achieve without this investment. And if we're honest with ourselves, much as we've made good progress, and we should be proud of that, we're a long way off track to achieve the Millennium Development Goals. In this part of the world, in the Asia Pacific, we're particularly off track in the issue of maternal mortality. It's not that we've made no progress. We shouldn't be embarrassed. We should claim the progress that we've made and say it's not enough. We need to do much, much more to achieve the Millennium Development Goals and then to go further. When, when we know that the key is investing in quality health services, we know that if we do that, we can make significant and demonstrable improvements in the lives of mothers and their children. And the evidence is clear. We also know that this will represent a significant flow on investment in social justice, social stability and economic productivity. Now, I'm very proud of the fact the Australian government is gearing up to do much more in this area. 16% of our aid budget goes on health, uh, about 595 million Australian dollars this financial year. 
and it's particularly designed to help strengthen national health systems and to meet the needs of women and children. We've also participated in what's called the Task Force on Inter International Innovative Financing for Health Systems. It's one of those really euphonious names that leaped readily to mind. I was on it for years. <laughs> I, can, I still can't remember its name without reading it. But it's an important group that worked, that was chaired by Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of the UK, and Bob Zellick, the President of the World Bank, about finding new ways to raise money to strengthen health systems. And I'm optimistic the Australian Government will make some announcements soon about the outcomes of that report. If you haven't read it, it's online. I recommend you go and have a look at that report. It says what governments can do and what individuals can do. And associated with that, uh, the Prime Minister has joined the network of global leaders, which is designed to provide political backing to the global campaign for the Health Millennium Development Goals. He's put his reputation on the line with a lot of other political leaders to say we are committed to achieving these Health Millennium Development Goals, but we don't want to just throw money at it, we want to invest money in it. We want to see what is the best way to spend money to achieve this result, to dramatically reduce child and maternal mortality. The data is clear, the investment case is very strong. The only thing, where, the only thing wrong is the lack of political will to do it. Now, it can't all be done by donors. It needs countries, the developing countries themselves, to take the lead in developing the policies, in setting the priorities, in choosing which of the various options set out in the investment case are best for their country, because it's not a one-size-fits-all model. We know that it will vary from country to country, and it's not for us to dictate to other countries how they should develop and structure their health system and deliver their health service. But we know that global health has significantly improved. We know that the world made a commitment in 2000 to Millennium Development Goal 4 and 5 about maternal and child health. So when you put together knowledge about what needs to be done, the capacity to provide resources <coughs> to do a large part of that, we need to focus on the question of why aren't we bringing those two things together? Why isn't this compelling case, this compelling investment case? Of course, fundamentally, the moral imperative you'd think would be sufficient to say, yes, we can save the lives of women and children. It's a pretty good starting point. But over and above that, we know that achieving all the other goals, fighting global poverty depends upon reducing the impact of maternal mortality and child mortality, lifting the levels of maternal and child health, we will get a massive return on our investment. We don't want to reach 2015 and have to admit we failed women and children by failing to provide them the opportunities <coughs> for good health that they're entitled to. The case for investment in child and maternal health is compelling. It's up to the audience, all of you listening, watching today, to engage in the discourse in Australia and around the world to make the case that will for governments to commit to a greater investment in maternal and child health. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> Thanks, Bob. Our next panellist is Tim Costello. <coughs> Tim is recognised as one of Australia's leading voices on social justice issues, having spearheaded public debates on gambling, urban poverty, homelessness, reconciliation and substance abuse. As Chief Executive of World Vision since February 2004, he has worked to ensure that the issues surrounding global poverty are placed on the national agenda. Tim has also played a prominent role in the Make Poverty History campaign and in April 2008 he, he chaired the Strengthening Communities, Supporting Families and Social Inclusion Committee of the Australian Government's 2020 Summit in Canberra. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can I say it's always a pleasure to uh, follow Bob. Um, I don't now need to uh, inject passion. I can be calculated and rational and logical. And I say seriously to um, have uh, a politician with uh, the passion that uh, Bob has, uh, we're really blessed. And uh, that's why it's, I think, one of the best windows of opportunity for us to, uh, to be taking these issues uh, seriously. 
Um, everything that Bob has said, I agree with. Uh, the simple statement that I'm sure you'll agree with is that if we don't help mothers in poor communities, particularly our Pacific Island neighbours, to survive their experience of birth, we can't expect to see a major shift in outcomes for children. No woman should die giving life. I was quite struck about three weeks ago to hear <clears throat> that out of Parks, New South Wales, a group that asks a novel question each year, had as its question this year, what would change everything? And they said uh, five out of, I think, think 150 respondents answered the knowledge that there's extraterrestrial intelligence, which made me wonder about terrestrial intelligence, frankly. <laughs> And uh, out of that question, they were uh, then saying to Australians, you can beam a message that to uh, Earth's nearest neighbour that uh, may actually connect, connect and communicate to extraterrestrial intelligence, and that will change everything. Well, my own view is that that question is a great question, and uh, it's a question that really should be applied to the challenges before us in the Millennium Development Goals. What would change, challenge everything and change everything? And uh, what we know, particularly about Goals 4 and 5, is that uh, there is a way forward. Um, I am discovering amongst the people who support us in World Vision and other NGOs almost a resigned um, numbness. They say, we go on supporting you, but actually we don't think it'll ever make much difference. It's right to support you, but we've now lived with uh, poverty and crisis for so long, we, we do it despite hopes that we might have had. So I find it's really important if we're going to ask the, answer the question, what would change everything, to keep hope alive. Um, 25 years ago, it was uh, 60,000 kids dying each day of uh, not enough nutrition and bad uh, water. Uh, we halved that two years ago to 30,000 kids. The figures out before Christmas last year was 26,000 or 25,000 kids. And I think it's really important to say in the global health area, we have been making some advances. And whilst we hold up the challenges, if we lose hope and perspective about how we can do this, then that numbness, that resignation, even that uh, disengagement that is really profoundly worrying occurs. Well, as you know, um, there is something like uh, 60,000 women, uh, 60 million women, sorry, not good on figures, 60 million women who each year uh, give birth without a skilled birth attendant. We know that 15% of births have complications. We know that there are far too, midwi too few midwives. The uh, WHO calculates that we need at least, conservatively, 350,000 more midwives uh, to be there. That's all incredibly important because the most uh, significant recommendation we can make is that uh, in birth, to reduce that horrific figure of half a million women dying in childbirth, which every Mother's Day should be the story. You know, we celebrate Mother's Day for all the right reasons, but half a million women dying in childbirth really is grave and serious and one of the uh, MDGs, as Bob said, that is most off track. We know that they die largely because of um, uh, hemorrhaging, postpartum um, hemorrhaging, because of uh, obstruction, that a skilled attendant can, if trained, address. We know that if they can get access to healthcare services quickly, because um, some will take two or three days to die, um, uh, if there is education to those who are around that woman that a fever or stomach pains or um, discharges are a worrying sign start now to move toward uh, where you can get help, that that woman will live. And we know the impact is absolutely phenomenal when uh, a mother dies, what it does for entrenching poverty in the family. Well, having just been given the one-minute signal, let me finish up by saying um, I think what the Australian government's been doing and its commitments have been magnificent. We've been 
arguing that our AusAid budget uh, allocation on health and maternal child, um, ch child and maternal health should be uh, up around the 500 million mark, going from 16% to 20% of the budget, because this is just so critical. To have in our region Papua New Guinea with a maternal mortality ratio of 733 per 100,000. Second highest maternal mortality ratio in the whole Asia Pacific region, second only to Afghanistan, is deeply, deeply worrying. It's not simply a lack of investment, though we are also calling for that. The Ministerial Task Force on Maternal Health in Papua New Guinea, produced by the National Department of Health in May 2009, is really honest and makes withering self-criticism of uh, the, uh, the government, particularly the decentralisation of government roles and responsibilities under the organic law that seriously compromise the quality and functionality of health services, including maternal health. A series of recommendations here that uh, are strong and serious about governance and administration and strengthening the health system in what has been by their own admission, a serious breakdown, a fundamental breakdown. These are challenges for our nearest neighbour and for us, and when you at least have reports that uh, hold up the mirror that honestly, there are challenges that I think we can join and uh, strengthen them in what they're doing. Since uh, Bob uh, and our, our uh, MC mentioned some of the climate change issues, let me finish by saying when Lancet says the greatest ch uh, challenge to child health is now climate change. What we now know is this huge compounding factor on top of what have been challenges as challenges for us to uh, deal with MDG4 and particularly MDG5. This is serious. This is grave. This requires our moral and political imagination and uh, thus I'm so pleased that you're here. Thank you, Tim Costello. And finally, I'd like to welcome back to Praxis Stephen Close. Stephen is the Human Development Specialist for the World Bank's Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and Pacific Islands country office in Sydney. He provides flexible strategic, operational and analytical support to World Bank task teams and client governments in the sectors of health, education and social protection. Stephen works particularly on health and education system strengthening in Solomon Islands, education system strengthening and vocational training in Timor-Leste and social protection work in Fiji and is particularly engaged on questions of operational effectiveness in sector-wide approaches in fragile states. Stephen. Thank you very much Ian. It's a pleasure to join these leading Australian advocates for development assistance uh, here today. As a non-Pacific Islander I'd like to qualify the views I present today but share them in a spirit of partnership. It's important to make the development case for investments in Pacific Islands health. Investments in health are not only an issue of citizens' rights, but also make good economic sense as they contribute to a mutually reinforcing cycle of economic growth and improved health outcomes. Let's recognise the advances made. By investing in health, Pacific Island countries and development partners have contributed to significant achievements. Since 1990, these have included considerably reduced rates of malaria in Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, halved infant mortality, and an extension of life ex expectancy by five to six years in these countries as well as in Samoa. However, policymakers in the Pacific are recognising that investments in health are not contributing to the same rate of improvement in health outcomes that were seen in the past. In fact, in some Pacific Island countries, major Pacific Island countries, health outcomes and systems performance have deteriorated. In Fiji, maternal mortality rates improved from 157 per 100,000 in 1970 to 27 per 100,000 in 1990 and then worsened to 31 in 2007, leaving Fiji off track for, the MD for this MDG. In Papua New Guinea, while there was a 35% increase in public funding of the health sector from 96 to 2004, 300 aid posts had closed in the five years to 2000, and births attended by skilled birth attendants decreased from 47 to 38 percent from 97 to 2005. Tim also mentioned the high maternal mortality rates in Papua New Guinea. Mr. McMullen discussed the unfinished agenda in maternal and child health. There are new challenges to health outcomes in the Pacific, such as the major impact of non-communicable and lifestyle diseases including vitamin deficiencies, global pandemics, the impacts of climate change and high fertility rates. 
While many Pacific Island countries have seen expansion of services over time and access for most, remaining constraints to achieve health outcomes include systems performance and the management of health systems to focus on results. Pacific Ministries of Health can't do it alone. Central Ministries, Pacific Islanders themselves, the private sector, non-government and development partners have roles to play in the innovative solutions required to address the complex remaining and emerging health challenges facing the Pacific. I'd like to discuss ideas for policy makers in the Pacific context and efforts to address these challenges both from inside and from outside Ministries of Health. Governance and management of health systems can assist in targeting available resources to achieve better outcomes. Investing sufficient allocations at the right level is part of the solution. Part of the context of declining health outcomes in Fiji is that it has the lowest investment in health of the Pacific, 2.6% of GDP in 2008, and loss of 40% of medical staff to emigration between 2003 and 2007. Costing health sector plans and discussion of national health budgets as the key country prioritising mechanism is important to allocate resources to improve outcomes. Allocation of resources to primary and preventative care at the provincial level is generally low. Addressing this now through costing health sector plans and delineating tertiary and primary health budget lines as currently in Solomon Islands can help Pacific Island countries to try and prevent public health crises and avoid the expensive and centralised tertiary health focus systems of developed countries. Healthcare in the Pacific is highly government financed and provided. Sustainable financing of health care can benefit from discussion and diverse approaches to user fees, social insurance and risk sharing mechanisms where this supports rather than harms access by service users. For instance, in encouraging and subsidising use of rural primary health facilities where possible rather than a focus on use of tertiary facilities. Effective strengthening of health systems needs support from actors outside ministries of health. Ministries of Finance can participate in discussion of adequacy, efficiency and targeting of health budgets. Coordinating across governments is necessary to address long-term problems around human resources for health, as decision-making on workforces in many Pacific Island countries is made outside of Ministries of Health. In Solomon Islands, direct wage employees can account for up to 80% of provincial health budgets, but they're often recruited by other units of government. Development partners can contribute by aligning their assistance to government leadership and systems. This includes maximising the opportunities of vertical disease approaches such as the Global Fund through integrating these with government-owned systems and plans. This also links to the global agenda for harnessing resources and capacities as discussed earlier by Mr McMullen. As discussed by, uh, by Tim, different approaches can improve health service delivery such as delegating accountability to those delivering services on the ground, equipped with adequate capacity and systems. Contracting to church, NGO or private providers and recognising traditional healers may allow government to circumvent capacity constraints and take advantage of the flexibility of alternative actors to achieve health outcomes. Incentives for health providers can help improve performance. Incentives for service users, such as health equity funds dispersed to poor households or adolescents, can help encourage use of services. Addressing health outcome challenges by helping people to lead healthy lifestyles needs both budget allocation to public health and better understanding of demands for health services, support for behaviour change and population based data to help provide the evidence for policy making. These solutions may lie with broader government agencies, civil society and members of the public. Besides behaviour change, the private sector can assist with considering food fortification and supporting trade in healthy foods, considering the long-standing issue of export of unhealthy foods in the Pacific and the role that has in contributing to lifestyle diseases such as diabetes. The largest number of Pacific Islanders live in Papua New Guinea. As Tim highlighted earlier, Papua New Guinea faces particular challenges, continued poor health outcomes particularly in rural areas and deteriorating rural service delivery. Continued fragmentation of responsibilities for health systems management in a decentralised environment has been part of the problem and therefore the participation of multiple agencies is important in identifying solutions. Rather than reiterate long stated problems, I'd like to indicate areas of recent action. Restoring and guaranteeing the inter integrity of core government processes is important, including budgeting, accounting, planning, procurement and payroll. This is particularly the case at the provincial level, given the province's role in service delivery. 
The National Department of Health leads a health sector steering committee to involve core agencies and development partners in the complex challenges facing health system strengthening. Working groups are addressing key issues including financing health service delivery, medical supplies, partnerships, human resources and access to quality care. NDOH has also prioritised evidence-based budgeting to better address service delivery constraints by aligning funding to health priorities. This evidence base is informed by work of the National Economic and Fiscal Commission, including analysis on the costs and systemic constraints to rural service delivery, new intergovernment financing arrangements to ensure better allocation to provinces, and priorities for improved financial management at province level. The NDOH is also leading a provincial health authority reform to combine health services with a single financing framework to support management of rural health service delivery. The fragmentation of responsibilities for health staff and payroll management is a long-term challenge. Guided by the PNG government, the World Bank is proposing analysis of health human resources in PNG to assist in the evidence base for addressing this across agencies. The bank's support for a proposed integrated biobehavioural survey will help provide population-based data on the drivers and trends of the HIV epidemic in Papua New Guinea, supporting targeting of available resources to best address this major challenge, with assistance from partners including AusAid and the Asian Development Bank. Timor-Leste proposes different health challenges from countries of the Pacific. My colleague uh, Manatanya in Dili is better placed to discuss Timor than I am, but Timor-Leste can benefit from the experience of many Pacific Island countries as it addresses its key challenges, which include continued low human development indicators, including an under five mortality rate of 130 per thousand, a high fertility rate of 7.8 children per Timorese woman, and a still emerging health system seeking to define its relationship with non-government providers. Continued investment in health with support by development partners is going to remain important in Timor for a long time. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss health challenges and issues in the region. I welcome discussion from the panel and the audience. Thank you very much, Stephen. Now that we've had a chance to hear from each of our panellists, it's uh, time for questions. We're still uh, waiting for questions to come through from our friends in uh, Timor and in uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so in the meantime, I'll invite questions from our audience here in Sydney. Uh, a microphone will be coming around to you. If you could stand up, wait for the microphone to come. When it reaches you, if you could say your name, where you're from, and then give us your question, and uh, try and keep your question or your statement as brief as possible, please, so we can get through as many as possible. So do we, can we have any questions from the, the audience here uh, in the corner, please? Uh, Anna Whelan, University of New South Wales. Uh, I'd like to thank the three speakers. Um, the, the issue of hope, I think, is a very good one, um, where we know that we have success stories and that telling those success stories is very important. Uh, and I, I welcome the investment of the government in um, um, improving funds to maternal and child health. I guess my concern is where, within countries, we see that uh, the inequalities are increasing and in inequity. So the rural urban issue that Stephen raised, I think, is is one that I would like to see the panel address, where we see improving maternal and child health indicators in urban areas, but in rural and remote areas, it's actually getting worse. The issue of human resources and health is crucial. How do we get people to stay in those areas? Uh, how do we get governments to uh, develop policies that will keep people and uh, provide the incentives? So there's some of the tricky questions I'd like the panel to help with. Uh, Bob, would you like to go sure. first? Thanks for starting with a tricky one, Anna. It's very <laughs> kind of you. Um, look, they are all important questions. Let me address one part of the equity. Uh, other people may be better placed on some of the others. But I think you see emerging various forms of social insurance models in developing countries that are about providing, targeting support to the neediest people. It's being done in Indonesia's got one innovative way of doing it. Others are looking other ways of doing it. And it is a way of bringing new funds in. It's a way of targeting resources at those most in need. And it does give you a capacity to address the issue that we all sort of overlook. Governments and donor partners spend a lot of money on health, but the evidence is clear. A very large part of health funding is private spending by individuals uh, to private providers. And when we talk about the health system, we too often don't address that. And the insurance models have got a chance of enabling the poorest people to have a chance to purchase. But the broad point Anna makes is right. The investment case document clearly says that when you increase the equity, 
you improve the outcomes. As well as the level of investment, the equity of the investment is a significant driver in the quality uh, of the outcomes of health investment. Tim, do you have anything to add? Yeah, look, I'd <coughs> just say the, the investment issue is, I think, uh, very important. Uh, it's estimated that I think we spend about $17 billion a year globally on maternal and child health. Um, it's estimated we need to be spending about $32 billion. So there's a big gap in terms of investment. Then the question is, but if there are systems that we are investing in which still aren't producing the results, uh, how do we get the alignment with the governance issues, with the rural-urban divide that you're talking about? And fundamentally with... Uh, the cultural issues, the uh, dirty little secret about all development is that it is essentially about disturbing power, whether it's the power of money lenders uh, by providing microfinance, whether it's the power of men who, uh, you know, make sure boys stay in school and girls don't. When girls stay in school and uh, there's education around birth spacing, we know for every year in school there's a drop in fertility of a, a couple of kids. But they're the first to to leave or not get access to school. So um, disturbing those power imbalances is uh, certainly uh, part of um, a discussion we have to have if we're going to get the equity questions right. What about the role of um, social entrepreneurs? How can they be brought into play? Um, I'm thinking about here particularly the, the Gates Foundation has mm -hmm. committed a billion uh, dollars to eliminate, eradicate uh, polio, uh, particularly on the subcontinent, mm -hmm. India, Pakistan. Uh, also Afghanistan as well. Can those sorts of organisations, can NGOs like World Vision, can governments like the Australian government uh, form partnerships with those sorts of organisations to, to further um, help uh, break down the, the disparities between developed and developing nations? We can do that at the macro level with big contributors like the Gates Foundation. I mean it's remarkable when you look at major contributors to the global fund, uh, AIDS, TB and malaria, now, this list is not accurate, but it gives the impression, you see, who are the big contributors? The United Kingdom, France, the Gates Foundation. It's like the third biggest country. If they were a donor, they'd be on the development of OECD's list at about the eighth biggest donor in the world, uh, um, ahead of us. Um, so uh, if World Vision was a country, it would be uh, about 16th on the list uh, of donors, bigger, not bigger than us, I hasten to say, Tim, uh, uh, but, uh, but, but bigger than, for example, our generous friends across the ditch in New Zealand, who are generous donors, but not a, don't provide as much globally as World Vision. So there are, we need to have our definition of what the health system is better. We too often talk about the health system and we slip straight to talk about the government health system. Mm. There's private players at that macro level, the great contributions of Gates and lots of others, but you mentioned them and they're the biggest, but also at the local level. There are small people doing innovative things outside the public system and we need to uh, not uh, bring them into the public system but just strengthen their opportunity to do things innovatively. Uh, people looking at incentives for people to provide services uh, and deliver the services they're getting paid to supply uh, is part of the sort of 21st century solution. I think we need to be more innovative in the economics of what we do. Yeah, Stephen, do you have a... Well, I, yeah, I've got a, I've got a few points. Um, I, I guess uh, it, there's been a great success uh, experienced in the, in the large vertical disease interventions and, and I guess in considering the coordination of development assistance in health, which has been a particular challenge, uh, it's important to find a balance of how uh, achieving outcomes in, uh, in those particular interventions can also contribute to the broader health system strengthening agenda to ensure sustainability uh, and, and broader benefits uh, in terms of health outcomes across the board. Um, I guess uh, on the issue of equity, it's important to consider how different ideas from a global experience can best be applied to the Pacific context where uh, there is heavy government financing and provision uh, and, and perhaps not uh, a tradition of considering what's possible from private providers or social entrepreneurs. Um, 
in, in fact, uh, with the low, relatively low user fees in many Pacific Island countries, that can have a, a particularly good outcome for equity. I think there's a good story to tell on equity in many Pacific Island countries. Um, but unfortunately, the, the strength and sustainability of those health systems to provide those services is, uh, is challenged. I guess one of, uh, one of our pleas from, uh, from the World Bank perspective is that uh, uh, even even knowing about the context of equity and how best to support that and how best to uh, understand differences between rural and urban divides uh, requires population-based data. Uh, there's a de uh, there needs to be a demand for data from governments in the region uh, and from development actors in order to uh, best plan and respond to meet those uh, those needs. Lovely, thank you. I've got a question and a statement here from uh, Monjir Hussain, who's a UNICEF representative in Timor-Leste, and this is picking up on something that you mentioned earlier, Bob. Um, the point is that the identification and prioritisation of best buys is critical. But what exactly is the tool used to do this with regards to costing elements as part of the overall health sector budgeting and the costing used in the investment case? How does the tool harmonise with the global and international tools? Okay, well, uh, there is no simple solution to that. Each country's got to find their own way. But what the investment case does, and it's not unique, it just brings together data that we've had in other places, like the WHO, is say, these are the proven methods that will work. Uh, to take the example that Tim used, and it's one that we talk about a lot, skilled birth attendance is the biggest correlation with reduced maternal mortality. So what do we need to do? to train more birth attendants, uh, midwives and people, at least with some level of skill and training, uh, through the hierarchy through to the most skilled specialists. And every country knows what their shortage is, whether that's the priority or whether we ought to go back to issues about water and sanitation, which uh, all the evidence says if we fixed up the water and sanitation, we'd save uh, $7 billion in global health spending. So it's a good investment. So each country has to look at it itself, but the costing question is critical. It, good investment means you've got to work out what's, what there's a cost and return in equation. It's not complicated, but it does require each country to look at it, and it goes back to Stephen's point about that he was just making about data. It's not sexy like some of the other subjects, but if you don't have good information systems, if you don't have a proper database, you can't make intelligent decisions. And we have to do more about that. Uh, it's a focus, something we, did, we talked about uh, in uh, the Pacific Forum in Cairns. And if I can just conclude on this point about that, I was one of the things I was delighted about, you know we've been negotiating partnerships for development with countries all around the Pacific. And when we were negotiating with PNG, we had a pretty well agreed set of priorities. And the PNG Minister for Planning came to me and said, I want to add another one. I want to add improved data collection, improved statistics. Uh, if you've met Paul Jensen, you know that I wasn't actually tempted to kiss him, but I was actually very, <laughs> he's a good friend, but not that good. But I was uh, excited about the fact that he took that initiative. Uh, he pushed on a very open door because we were delighted. But that is a priority and we need to do more about it. Lovely. Thank you very much. So there's a gentleman at the back with a point to make, please. Thank you. My name's Anthony Zui. I'm a professor in uh, global health and development also at the University of New South Wales. also wanted to congratulate the um, panel, I mean, representing um, the Australian government, global civil society, and the international financial institutions and development agencies in identifying health as an absolutely key area for investment and the importance of supporting that. I wanted to follow on the point about good data to make the point that the sorts of changes that we are seeing and this, the pace and speed with which they're occurring, whether it's climate change or the global financial crisis or changing um, range of players in the global health environment really calls for not only ongoing data collection but high levels of ongoing documentation and analysis and reflection. And I wanted to put to the panel um, the view um, that um, investing in that analytic capacity is absolutely crucial and that that cannot be done as a short-term investment. It requires 
um, developing and funding high levels of research, building teams, building partnerships with the countries that we're talking about and building their capacity to analyze and reflect on interventions and system change and to evaluate those carefully. Um, so really just a, a plea, but also a, a question about where does um, ongoing research partnership for development fit into this equation? Thank you. Bob, for you, I think. Okay. Uh, what I take out of that, I mean, I, I could just say I agree, but the question part of it, what the data shows is that the best result in improving maternal and child health is when you strengthen the health system as a whole and the fundamental but unromantic part of that is statistics data analysis. So I agree with that and we need to do more. And following on from Stephen's point, the, one of the very encouraging things that came out of that task force I mentioned earlier was a proposition that came from the, the Global <coughs> Alliance on uh, Vaccines and Immunisation and the Global Fund for Age, TB and Malaria to work together to direct their resources to strengthening health systems instead of being quite so separate as vertical funds. And that was about being more efficient in how we spend the money, not just more efficient in how we raise it. So I, I think that is a, a big priority. The other thing that we have to remember is the demand this places on the very small countries in the Pacific. When you have a country with, uh, let alone the very smallest ones, with 1,500 or 12,000 people, but a country with a sophisticated demand in Samoa and Tonga, where we're talking about 100 to 200,000 people trying to deliver the sophisticated level of health analysis. Not because they're not smart people, absolutely they are. There's just not many of them. And therefore the demands on them to cope with the administrative challenge is an extra element that we have to look at. And it probably leads us to some sort of regional solution, I think, whether through the forum or the Secretary of the Pacific Community. I think some of these things in the Pacific we're going to have to do on a regional basis instead of country by country. That's easy to say and hard to do uh, because there are sovereignty issues involved, but that I think is the direction we have to go in. But that core question about strengthening health systems is central, I agree. Tim, quick point on that. Can, can I say, I think the, the advent of the Gates Foundation has been fantastic for NGOs and civil society because they actually have invested in research and evidence-based empirical uh, uh, cases, which I think has lifted the performance of a whole lot of NGOs that are in civil society doing the, the grunt work, you know, as we are with 40,000 staff. The second thing is um, I think um, the key which we all look to unlock uh, why a particular result uh, requires research. The uh, fact is we know we're spending relatively high levels of ODA even on child and maternal health in the Pacific compared to other regions of the world but not getting the same results. So what is this key that we need to, and we have to think about that. And I think there is now a global appetite for it. You know, when some people get sick in Mexico and you close a, a primary school in Clifton Hill, Melbourne, or up here, there is suddenly this sense, we've got to understand what the health uh, contours are. So now's the time to actually galvanise that sort of support. Uh, Vina Miro from the Sustainable Development Programme in PNG wonders what the panel's view on the role of public-private partnership in terms of service delivery in rural areas and how to ensure that service delivery is needs-driven rather than funding-driven. Uh, Stephen, can you reveal that for us, please? That's a very good, a very good question, uh, coming from, I guess, the front line of public-private partnerships in the Pacific. Uh, uh, we, we know that there's been particular work um, on, on public-private partnerships uh, in Papua New Guinea, uh, uh, considering the, the Asian Development Bank's uh, enclave development support. Um, that, that's a, that, that is a, a, a challenging question. I, I, I guess it, I'd draw it back to our discussion of uh, the basis of data. Uh, data to understand the demands, health-seeking behaviour of local communities uh, and uh, finding uh, systemic approaches to ensure that that data is used as a basis for decision-making, um, uh, to, to ensure that uh, decision-making is evidence-based. And uh, I, I would say that it, it's, it's not that uh, public-private partnerships are necessarily going to uh, address uh, local demands any worse than government services um, and uh, in fact uh, in certain ways may be better able to address um, local demands because of certain aspects of comparative advantage and, and flexibility. So I, I guess 
there are uh, issues of health systems design uh, and a focus on strengthening the evidence base uh, and uh, considering appropriate modes of community engagement uh, and, and recognising uh, health seeking behaviour that apply both to public private partnerships and, uh, and uh, regular government financed and government provided systems but this is an area of innovation and uh, we still need to think more about the new generation of, uh, of questions about how to ensure the public private partnerships are effective uh, countries like Solomon Islands and PNG are still building their formal relationships with uh, with non-government organisations for service provision and we're still learning just uh, which organisations uh, have comparative advantage in, in which services. Uh, Teresa de, de Jesus from the National University of Timor-Leste um, says material and child mortality is very high in Timor. What ways can this be reduced and what advice can you offer for Timor-Leste, which is a country with really basic health facilities? Tim, if you could give a short answer to, or short thoughts on that, please. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and Timor-Leste is uh, a country with one of the highest birth rates uh, and therefore, in terms of the uh, demographic of the population, um, uh, an intense need to actually get this question right because uh, it's only going to uh, become more challenging and uh, potentially greater suffering. The, the answer really lies in a range of interventions. We know that interventions, uh, the most significant being skilled birth attendance at whatever grade, access uh, of villages to understanding symptoms to get people to care. We know that uh, simple things from iron folate uh, tablets to deal with uh, anemia to um, the strengthening of vitamin A, uh, rehydration interventions, uh, dealing with diarrhea. Those uh, understandings of simple interventions are the difference between life and health, uh, life and death, and um, for good health. And uh, in Timor Leste, uh, there's still a long way to go to actually entrench that culture and that understanding. Thank you, Tim. Uh, time for another question from in Sydney, please. Yes, sir, at the front. Hi, Joel Negan from the University of Sydney. Uh, I know this is a health forum, but I just wanted to add a couple components uh, that we haven't talked about. Um, Tim did briefly allude to women's education, um, and that really is one of the best buys for maternal health and for child health. And it might not be something that we'll find uh, results from in a year or two in our kind of short-term thinking, but in a 10-year, 15-year cycle, that's something we should be looking at. So I want to just make sure that we're also thinking outside of our health silo and thinking about education. Similarly, malnutrition, um, about 53% of the deaths of children under five has, is, attributable, is attributable to malnutrition. So we should also be talking about not just vitamin A supplementation and, and fortification, but also on agriculture, food production, food security. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, our panelists are also thinking uh, outside of the health silo that a lot of us in this room are in. Thank you. Excellent points, and I'm sure taken on board. Uh, we've got a, a question from Dr. Glenn Mola in PNG. This is for you, Bob. Uh, he's wondering, would it be possible to have a roundtable discussion about how we can achieve the goals of the recent PNG Maternal Health Improvement Task Force actually held in PNG with those who are working towards those goals? Yes, uh, sounds like a good idea. Uh, w uh, I think it's primarily the responsibility of the government of Papua New Guinea, but if they come to us and say, We've just done this task force. Uh, we've got some ideas we'd like to have a discussion about. Uh, we and I think all the other donors would be keen to join. And the most important thing is to make sure we are coordinated because uh, uh, one of the biggest problems in Papua New Guinea is the proliferation of small aid activities. Uh, last count, more than a 1,000 aid activities, not just in health, of course, but across the range, going on in Papua New Guinea. So we need to coordinate better. Our Prime Minister spoke about that at the Cairns uh, uh, Pacific Island Forum meeting and led to the Cairns Compact about better coordination. So if we plug that into it and say, yes, let's get these get people together, all the contributors, principally the government of Papua New Guinea, other suppliers in PNG, and those of us who are uh, donors and participants, uh, both uh, multilateral and bilateral, uh, let's get together and talk about it uh, in PNG. Much better to do it there than here and much better to have people who are experts in it uh, talking about it than people like me. So uh, I'd be very keen to have it supported. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, another question, please, from the room in the corner. 
Hi, I'm Anna Dubell. I recently spent nine months in the Philippines as part of AusAid's Youth Ambassadors for Development program. One of the issues I saw there was that doctors were retraining as nurses so that they could go overseas and work, say, in the US because the incomes were better. How can, what sort of policies can encourage those skilled individuals to, communi uh, to contribute to their own communities and how can that be balanced against the remittances that would otherwise be earned? Uh, very good question, Stephen. Quick, quick answer on that one, please. Well, unfortunately, uh, I, I wouldn't say that we have all the answers on uh, health worker migration because this is a very serious issue uh, for the Pacific as well, as I, as I mentioned, for Fiji. Uh, for individuals, there are great opportunities in health migration. For systems, it's, uh, it's a lot of challenges. I, I think it... Uh, I think finding a solution could start by open discussion of... Uh, of migration. Uh, uh, some Pacific Island countries have greater experience of how to harness uh, remittances and labour migration for economic growth, but uh, balancing that with the effect on health systems of losing staff is, is a real challenge. Uh, there's also the point that brain drain can turn into brain gain if staff are moving overseas in order to uh, learn skills that aren't available in the home country and then move back home again. Um, really it's, it's a question of improving incentives. The Solomon Islands has a, uh, a relatively good experience of improving in incentives for health staff uh, so that perhaps not so many locals leave but also so that uh, people from other Pacific Island countries seek to, to move to the Solomon Islands. But of course also working conditions and delegation of accountability uh, and sufficient management training uh, so that uh, people in the health system can, can do their jobs effectively are also part of the story on improving uh, conditions. Uh, and uh, as part of the labour migration agenda, uh, being able to export labour for economic opportunities isn't always a bad thing but it is a challenge that health systems should address innovatively. Lovely. Thank you very much for that, Stephen. We're just getting our, our final question through uh, from the web at the minute. So I'll just take this opportunity to point out that you'll be able to, uh, to watch this uh, Praxis Roundtable at www.worldbank.org forward slash PI. Uh, and the question is coming through now. Thank you very much. This is from um, Papua New Guinea, Habu Ranu Marie Stopes. I hope I pronounced that properly. There are small organisations that do their little bit to improve health. They're not part of the public health systems. How uh, would their sustainability be ensured should the public see them as competitors? Should the public see them as competitors and not partners? That's a question there. Uh, Tim, if you could fill that for us, please. Yeah, um, the, the two challenges here are to actually um, make sure that those with vocation and uh, commitment to do their bit in an NGO are doing it in a way that isn't simply fragmenting the rest of the system, that they are connected, uh, feeding in, um, that they aren't allowing civil society, uh, even government, to say, uh, well, we leave health now to church and NGOs and we're off the hook. <laughs> Not that anyone would uh, articulate it that way, but it can be the impact, the shift, a subtle shifting of where responsibility lies. However, um, I think it's certainly the case that uh, many of these um, health services are run by very committed people who have great quality in their care and uh, as it's, I think, in the ministerial task force from um, um, Papua New Guinea, the public often trusts them more than they trust government services. So you don't want to lose what they're doing, but you want to help it uh, mainstream and flow into affecting the public system. Lovely. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for today. I'd just like to thank our panellists, the Honourable Bob McMullen MP, Tim Costello and Stephen Close. Praxis will return next month. Until then, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.